Wait a minute, hopefully you didn't get a little vertigo there as the camera has panned around. Uh, Zach's right, this is a little bit different for us, but hey, I'm excited that we live in a time that even when we can't meet shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, we can still meet together every Sunday morning and worship together. Uh, what a, a powerful message we've already received, as we've already heard and thought about the fact that we need to be praying through this, not just our God is great, God is good prayer, but we need to make this our life source, our power uh, as we go through this. So thank you, Zach, for uh, that powerful message through song as we got ready for this morning. Now, I don't know about you, uh, this is kind of an odd day already. Uh, some of you, you're sitting here watching, and be honest, you're still in your PJs. Um, even though we sent out an email that said, hey, get ready like you normally would for church, dress, get ready so you can get in that mind frame. Some of you are sitting there with in your PJs. You might have your bowl of fruity pebbles in your lap right now. Um, but it's just a little bit odd today. And unless, if we're really honest, it's been odd for a couple weeks. Uh, but I told you last week when we were talking about having to probably shift these, some things and go a different direction, that as much uncertainty as there is around us right now, I am convinced that God has something big and powerful uh, in the middle of this pandemic that he's going to use it in a mighty, mighty way. And what I believe we're going to see happen is that God is going to use this to be the catalyst for a real revival. This is what is going to spark Christians to say, there's more to it than what I've been living out. And a lost world is going to see that and take note. And because of that, souls are going to come to be saved. And we're as uh, heard said before, there'll be more people in heaven and less people in hell because of what happens with our influence to the middle of this. Now, I've already seen some really good things happening just in the, over the last couple weeks that are good from this pandemic. We've seen successes. Some of you, uh, I, I've seen the church step up and look for new ways to serve and reach out. It says it doesn't matter if we can meet here in this building. We're going to look for ways to be the church. I've seen communities come together to meet a need like feeding school children who maybe the only meals that they got were when they went to school. And communities have come together to help meet that need. I've seen families come together and rediscover what quality time with one another looks like. I'm going to tell you, we have watched more Disney Plus and uh, Lion Guard and all kinds of things in our house than I ever thought was possible. But it was neat and it's been cool because we've been able to do it together as a family. And we see all these things going on around us. And you may have seen a success in your life. God working in you and through you in the middle of this pandemic to do something that maybe you never thought was possible. And if that's you this morning, I just want us to stop for a second. I just want to give you a piece of advice. If you have seen God work through you, if you've seen God do something in your life that you didn't think was possible, can I just tell you, don't let your guard down. Don't for a second ease up. Don't think for a minute that, hey, I've had this mountaintop experience. It's all going to be good from here. Don't let your guard down and take your focus off of Jesus. In Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, we see that we're commanded to fix our eyes on Jesus. And not just temporarily, not just in the good situations, not even just in the bad situations, but we're supposed to fix our eyes on Jesus all the time. But if you read on in there, it's not just that we're supposed to fix our eyes on Jesus. It tells us what happens if we fail to do so. It says if we fail to fix our eyes on Jesus, we're in danger of growing weary and losing heart. Folks, as we've talked about Elijah over the last few weeks, we've seen Elijah accomplish some great things, or God accomplish great things through him. But in 1 Kings chapter 19 today, we're going to see that Elijah took his eyes off of God. Even for just a split second, he took his eyes off of God, he lost focus, and it cost him dearly. So while you're flipping to 1 Kings 19 this morning, I just want to recap where we've been. Uh, when we met Elijah... He was this nobody from nowhere, this tiny town of Tishba. And God calls him onto the scene to be his man for this moment. As he stood before the most wicked king that Israel had ever known. And he boldly proclaimed the truth that God had called him to proclaim. And that is he was calling his people back to repentance. But he said, Ahab, it's not going to rain until I say so. And because of this, Elijah became a wanted man. Ahab wanted to kill Elijah. God sends Elijah into hiding where he can take care of him, where he can protect him, but also where he can train him and prepare him for what comes next. And finally, God calls Elijah out of 
the wilderness and he sends him back before Ahab and we get the showdown on Mount Carmel where Elijah is called for, for Ahab to bring the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah and all the people of Israel to assemble on Mount Carmel. They were going to have this sacrifice. And Elijah said, boys, you go first. And he lets the prophets of Baal prepare their altar, prepare their sacrifice. And the deal was they were going to pray to their gods, of which everyone answered by fire by consuming the sacrifice. He was the real God. Well, all day goes by. Morning turns into afternoon. Elijah is taunting the prophets of Baal, but still nothing happens. And as the evening approaches, Elijah says, it's my turn. And he has the people's full attention at this point as he repairs the altar and he lays the sacrifice on. Elijah prays and God answers. Fire falls from heaven and it consumes not just the meat from the sacrifice. It consumes the wood, the stones, the water that he had poured around it. Everything completely, totally consumed. It says to the people who were once silent, with one voice shout out, The Lord, He is God. It says they turned on the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah and put them to the sword. Elijah looks at Ahab and says, you better take off back home because it's about to rain and I don't want you to get stuck. And Ahab takes off back to his palace. And Elijah is left there with his servant to bask in the glory of what God has just accomplished in him and through him. That God had done exactly what he said all those years ago. He had turned to hard-hearted people back to himself. Now Elijah has to be on top of the world. And why wouldn't he be? He's just seen God do something completely amazing. He's done, seen God do something that he could never explain. But what we're fixing to see is that things change in a hurry. All of a sudden, it's different. This strong man of God suddenly becomes weak. When we started the study of Crossroads, we made this statement. We said often we're our most spiritually vulnerable as we've experienced our biggest spiritual successes. And that's exactly what we're fixing to see here in the story of Elijah. So if you got your Bible open, I hope you do, we're going to pick up in 1 Kings 19, verse 1. It says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid. And he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and he fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went to a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? I wonder if Elijah wondered the same thing. How did I get here? I was just on Mount Carmel. I just saw God do amazing things. How did I get here? 
We ask the same question when we look at this story. What happened? How did things go south so quickly? Well, folks, quite simply, Elijah lost focus. Elijah took his eyes off the one who had given him the strength to do all these great things, to stand before Ahab, to survive in the wilderness, to stand and, sur and thrive amongst a hostile crowd on Mount Carmel. He took his eyes off the one who helped him do all of that. Now, before we get on Elijah's case, I've been there. So have you. We've all had those moments where, yes, we've just seen God do extraordinary things in us and through us. But in a momentary lapse of focus, we take our eyes off of him and it proves costly. We let our guard down. We shift that focus for just a second and poof, disillusionment sets in. Now, if we're going to guard against this, we've got to understand something about our enemy. Our enemy is constantly looking to try and make you take your eyes off of God. He's constantly trying to trip you up and trap you, but especially after God has moved in your life in a mighty way. He is looking to stop you at any cost. That's what we see in Elijah. The enemy had tripped him up. The enemy had snared him in a trap. And he's wanting to do the same to us if we're not careful. So this morning, what we're going to spend our time doing is we're going to look at three traps that I believe the enemy is looking to throw your way. Three things that the enemy is looking to use to trip you up as we come off of a spiritual success. The first one is this. Many times the enemy will try to get you to listen to negative influences. Look with me again at how this passage started. It says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, to catch this, to say, May the gods deal with me, bid ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Do you catch what she's saying to Elijah? May my gods who just got discredited on Mount Carmel, may they deal with me ever so severely if I don't kill you the same way you just killed all the prophets. That's a pretty negative influence. You see, despite what God had done in Elijah's life, despite how he had proven himself over and over again, all it took to scare and discourage Elijah was the negative threats of one woman. Now, husband, some of you are sitting there next to your wife on the couch right now, and I do not want you to turn and look at her and say, see, I told you so. No, no, we're not making a comment about men or women here, but I want you to notice it's all it took was one person, one single person, to make a threat towards Elijah. And in that moment when his focus was off God, it scared him enough that he ran. He ran away. That don't make good sense to me. Because time and time again, God had proven himself capable of taking care of Elijah. From the very beginning of Elijah's story as we know it, God was taking care of him. As he led him from Tishba, to come before Ahab, God led him and took care of him. As God took him back out into the wilderness, God provided for him, gave him food and water in a time when it was scarce. As God brought him back before Ahab and went to Mount Carmel, God sustained him and delivered him from the prophets of Baal there. God has proven to Elijah time and time and time again, I can and I will take care of you. But in this moment of weakness, this temporary loss of focus. Elijah forgot all that. Elijah forgot that how capable his God was of caring for him. Folks, if we're not careful, we buy into the same negative influence. We listen to all the negativity that's going on around us and it scares us and it discourages us. Let's be honest. Right now, there's a lot of negativity to go around. I'm not talking just outside the church. I'm talking about inside the church. The people of God. There's a lot of negativity to go around. We hear things like this right now. As we start talking about Corona and this pandemic. Is it a hoax? Is this something that's just made up for political purposes or whatever? Or is it legit? And folks, I'm going to tell you. I've heard church people argue both sides of this passionately. And the problem is they turn their negativity towards each other. It goes on further than that. And we have this faith versus fear. Am I going to have faith or am I going to have fear? And 
We've heard it said this morning already that we're not supposed to be fearful. We're not commanded to have a spirit of fear. But when there's concern, does that mean a lack of faith? And again, we see church people fighting over this, arguing back and forth, directing their negativity at one another. And it all kind of, kind of comes to a head when we ask a question that we had to answer as leadership this week. Of will we meet or we will, will we not meet? And it's been this case of, well, if you have enough faith, you'll meet. If not, you won't. And we see this negativity back and forth all over our country right now. Folks, there is plenty of negativity to go around. And it's all from the enemy. Because all he wants to do is to scare you and discourage you. Just like negativity, the negative influence of one person scared Elijah. The enemy is wanting to use this negativity to scare us. He's wanting it to scare us to the point that we fail to continue to trust in God and focus on Him. If you've been a Christian for very long at all, you know this is one of the devil's biggest schemes. It's one that he uses often, and he uses it well. And you know why he keeps going back to it? Because it works. It works. We let him in. We let those negative influence in. And it scares us and it discourages us from the work that God has called us to. But I want you to think for a second. Why would the devil want us discouraged. Why would the devil want us to lose focus? Because he wants nothing more than to make us stop before life change can take root. He wants us to stop looking to God. He wants us to stop trusting in God because if we do, the changes that he's working in us, the successes that we see through us, stop before they can ever take root. I want to encourage you. Don't give in to that. Keep your guard up. Stay focused. Well, preacher, how do I do that? You know, there, it seems like there's so much negativity going around. How do I keep my guard up and stay focused in the middle of all that? Well, there's some really practical things we can do. First, look for the positives. In my youth ministry days, we'd go on mission trips, and some of my kids will tell you that, that when we would have group meetings at night, the very first thing that we would ask for isn't what went wrong. What went wrong? What can we improve? That stuff came later. But the very first thing that we would always ask, hey, what went well today? What did you see that was good? Because see, we realized something. That if we started looking at things through that lens, even the things that we needed to improve on, became a positive. But if it was just what went wrong, what made me upset, I never saw the positives of the day. Maybe that's where you need to start. Maybe you need to look for the positives going on around you. Maybe you need to look for the fact that God is doing great things among you, even in weird, unusual circumstances. Look for the positives. We need to claim truth. We know that this Bible that we have in front of us from Genesis to Revelation is 100% completely true. And it is chock full of truth for times just like this. Folks, Folks, it's in times like this that we got to claim the truth. we got to take God at His word and says, He said it was true then, it's true now. I'm going to claim it, I'm going to believe it, and I'm going to trust that God is going to do what only God can do. See, when I claim truth, a lot of those negative influences lose sway with me. They lose meaning because I know what's real. It doesn't matter what they try to get me to believe. It doesn't matter what they try to convince me of. I know what's real because I'm grounded in the truth. So maybe that's what you need to do today. Maybe you just need to get in your word and claim some truth in the middle of negative influences. But probably more than anything, as Zach's already talked about it this morning, we need to pray often. We need to be on our knees in prayer to God. Maybe you've got somebody in your life that is that negative influence. And you just need to take them to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why they're trying to do this. But Lord, I trust you. Trust that God is going to work in your heart regardless of that influence. Or maybe, as we've been talking, you go, I'm that negative influence. And we need to hit our knees in and repent before God and say, Lord, forgive me for being the stumbling block for somebody else. We need to be praying. We need to pray often if we want to overcome negative influences. It's one of the biggest traps, one of the biggest scenarios that Satan will try to use to get to you at this time. 
there's another trap that he's going to try to use. He used it for Elijah, and that was trying to get us to give in to self-pity. I want you to just imagine that you're Elijah, and you have just come off of Mount Carmel, and, and as you have envision this time of what it was going to be like and how things were going to go, I imagine Elijah saw things going much differently than this. He thought that, hey, God is going to show out. He's going to consume the sacrifice. And you know what? Ahab is going to see that he is God and he's going to repent and he's just going to turn and he's going to love God with all that he has. Maybe Elijah thought, hey, when God shows out, Jezebel is all of a sudden going to be this sweet, nice lady, and nobody will have to be afraid to be around her anymore. Maybe he thought, this people is going to come to me, they're just going to continuously thank me for calling them to repentance and showing them the error of their ways and never giving up on them. Maybe all of these are what Elijah had expected to happen. But it's not what happened at all. What's it say? It says, one woman breathes a threat to him. The first words that Elijah hears as he gets to the bottom of Mount Carmel isn't thank you, isn't good job, it's you're going to die. Wow. You talk about the ultimate disappointment. Elijah just poured his heart and soul into this. And he doesn't at all get what he thinks might be coming. And look what his response is. Verse 4, or verse 3, it says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed, and get what he prayed, that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Elijah's response Jezebel's threats is to run away and have a full-blown pity party. Now look around the room that you're in. There's a good chance that somebody in there has thrown a pity party. And there's a good chance it's you. I've thrown plenty. They happen often. And it's always because I've taken my eyes off of God. But Elijah took his eyes off God and it descended into this full-blown pity party. He was pouting before God because in his mind he had done so much for God and he couldn't believe that this was the things that he was going to get. Elijah gets totally dramatic. He has himself a moment and he tells God he just wishes he was dead. Again, before we get too hard on Elijah, we've all had pity parties. Some of you may be having one today. Well, this isn't what I want to happen. This isn't where I wish I was this morning. Can I be honest with you? I wish y'all were here with me too. I wish this building was full when we were meeting together. But I'm not going to have a pity party because things didn't work out the way that I wanted. This morning, many of you, you've started dreaming what life is going to be like when things go back to normal. When you can meet with your faith family again, when you can be around loved ones again and share with them all that God has been doing in your life, you started dreaming about what that's going to be like. You can't wait to see how your loved ones, your faith family embraces you and, and celebrates the changes that God has made in you. And you want to see how it affects others. And many of us, we may be expecting that Everyone's just going to be as enthusiastic about what God is doing in you and through you as you are. And for some of you, that'll be the case. You'll find people who absolutely are excited to hear what God has done through you during this time of isolation. There are going to be people who will celebrate alongside of you all that God has done and all that God has showed you. But I don't want you to be caught off guard like Elijah was. And some people don't respond the way that you hoped that they would. I wish I could sit here as your pastor and tell you that in a church, everybody's going to be enthusiastic for you. Everybody's going to be excited that God is doing something new and incredible in you. But that would be a lie. Not everybody is going to be that enthusiastic. Not everybody's going to be that welcoming. And I want you to know that it's coming because I don't want you to give in to a pity party when it doesn't happen the way that you thought it ought to. Here's what I've learned about pity. And folks, this is something that we need to take seriously, we need to take note of. Pity is a momentum killer. 
You've seen God working through you. You've seen that momentum starting to build as he's doing greater and greater things through you, opening your eyes to more and more possibilities. And you can just literally feel the momentum welling up and building inside of you. But if you give in to pity, it's going to kill the momentum. We're, one of the things that we are missing out on right now is uh, March Madness. My wife is probably grateful that we don't have to watch random basketball games right now. But I love the, the story of March Madness. I love 68 teams come together and it's just this elimination until you get down to the one. But one of the things I love best about watching March Madness is in, undoubtedly you're going to get an underdog. This underdog's going to face a team. They have no business being in the same gym with. They have no business uh, playing because there's not really any reason to think that they're going to win. But as you're watching the game unfold, you see momentum starting to build. They make this run and things start going their way. And then if I've seen it once, I've seen it a hundred times. A whistle blows. A call goes against their team. And in that moment, a decision has to be made. Are they going to let that moment go and keep pressing forward with momentum? Or are they going to dwell on the thing that didn't go their way? I can tell you without fail, you watch the team who dwells on it, the momentum is stopped, and more times than not, they lose. Folks, pity is a momentum killer. Because at its core, what pity is, is focus on, focusing on something that is gone. It's finished. We can't change it. When we give in to self-pity, we choose to halt momentum by staying in a place that didn't go the way we wanted it to. That's not what we're called to do. Instead of giving in to self-pity, we ought to be reminded and Stay focused on one who can bring positive change about, regardless of whether it's in my time frame or not. Elijah missed that, and it left him wallowing in self-pity, wanting to die. Now, there's one more thing that we're going to talk about this morning, one more trap that our enemy uses to try and trip us up. And that is, he tries to get us to believe a lie. Look with me at verse 10. Elijah is out there. The Lord has spoken to him. He says, what are you doing here? And Elijah replies, I've been very zealous for the Lord, God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. I want you to look down just a few verses at verse 14. It's the same thing. Why are you here, Elijah? And Elijah spits it out verbatim. It is his rehearsed practice response of why I'm here, why I can justify my actions. But I want you to catch the crux of what's going on here. He says, I, I, I'm done, I'm through, I, I, I've been done, I've done everything you wanted me to do, but I just want to quit. Why? Because I'm alone. I'm alone. Now, folks, that doesn't, I don't get that. We've just read the story of Elijah. We know what's been going on in his life. Elijah has let himself believe the lie that the enemy told him, that you are alone, even though he knows better. We saw in Elijah's story, it hadn't been days ago that he meets up with Obadiah, and Obadiah tells him that he personally has been taking care of 100 of God's prophets, making sure they had food and water in this difficult time. It has just been a matter of hours since Elijah stood on Mount Carmel, and he sees a people Turn in repentance and acknowledge that the Lord is God. Yet here he has convinced himself that he's alone. Folks, I want you to understand something. It's easy for us to get discouraged when we let ourselves follow the lie. It's easy to let ourselves stay discouraged and become desperate and despondent when we know we're not following the truth. See, the more that Elijah thought about the fact that he believed he was alone, the deeper his depression and his desperation went. Here we are in quarantine. I'm sitting here at church, and there's not very many of us here. You're sitting in your house, and you're probably getting cabin fever because you just dream of the days when you can get out and just go to McDonald's. One of the things that the quarantine does is it lets loneliness creep in. It makes us feel 
isolated. It doesn't matter if we got people right next door to us. We feel isolated and separated like we are all alone. There's many of you that you're, you're disconnected from loved ones. There's been people who've had medical emergencies that you can't be there for because of quarantine. There's been many of you who say, I just can't wait for the day that I can get back and worship with my faith family. And trust me, we look forward to that too. But it's left us feeling alone. And we don't like that because none of us want to be alone. And the reason is that we were designed for community. We were designed to do life together. We were designed to share each other's burdens. As a faith family, we've been called to walk shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, fighting side by side. But you see, Satan knows that we don't like to be alone. He knows that's not how we were designed. But he knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that it's in our nature to want to give up we feel like we're the only one fighting. Can I encourage you for the, just a second this morning? Don't buy the lie. Don't feed into it. You are not alone. No, we may not be in the same building. We, not be, may, we may not be physically standing shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, but I can tell you we are fighting together. You're not fighting alone. Church, hear me on this. Quarantine has made community more difficult, yes. But it has not made it impossible. Community is still there to be had. We just have to be more intentional about it. That means get up, make that phone call, send that text, write that letter, comment on that post, like that tweet. Let people know that you're there with them. Let your brothers and sisters in Christ know that you're still there, fighting alongside them, standing up for them. But we are not alone in this. Don't let Satan discourage you with a lie. Know that God has brought people alongside of you, even if they're in another house, another city, they are still here with you in spirit, fighting with you, and they're here to keep you strong. I love the story of Elijah because I can relate to it. We see Elijah here, a man who has been a part of things that I can only hope for and imagine. But the part that I can relate to is Elijah blowing it. And he blew it royally. Elijah was being used by God in a mighty way and in a moment of weakness seemingly threw it all away. And that's kind of what we think sometimes, isn't it? If I have a moment of weakness, does that disqualify me? Am I, am I done? Is God through with me? I want to close this study out by looking at the rest of this passage. Look at me, look with me at verse 15. It says, The Lord said to Elijah, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king of Aram, also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king of Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Mahalah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. You may look at that and go, what are you getting at? Did you notice that God didn't look at Elijah and say, I'm done with you. God doesn't look at Elijah and tell him how worthless he is. He doesn't scold him for his moment of weakness. No. Instead, God simply puts Elijah back to work and reminds him that he still has everything under control. Folks, some of you are in the middle of success right now. God is using you in ways that you've prayed for for a long time. And if that's the case, get ready. These traps are coming. Some of you are on the tail end of this. Success came, and in a moment of weakness, you let the devil trap you, trip you up. And now you're kicking yourself going, I had a good thing and I blew it. No, you didn't. Our God still wants to use you. The same way that he used Elijah, 
He still had work for him to do. He still had a job, and he sent him back out to do it. There's a day coming, and I hope soon, we're all going to meet together, and we're going to celebrate all the things, all the successes that God has been doing in our lives during this time of isolation. But until that day comes, until we can meet together side by side, shoulder to shoulder, stay focused. Keep your eyes on the one who can take care of you in any situation. Do the work that he's called you to do. Don't turn from it to the left or to the right. But always, always, remember he's still in control. God's not through with us yet. And I know he's got big plans for all that we're going through. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now and we thank you that Lord, you are the master of making bad things good. And taking something that is awful, or take something that is uncomfortable, but Lord, making something beautiful out of it. Lord, I pray that we, as your servants, because we remember the story of Elijah, Lord, we would be encouraged that you can use us in those same ways. That God, we can all have our Mount Carmel moments. But God, I pray that you prepare us for those times where the devil is going to attack us because he doesn't want us to carry on down that road. Lord, I know it's coming. Lord, I, I, I hurt because we can't physically be there for one another. Lord, I pray we never fail to lift each other up spiritually. Lord, as we reach out and we talk it up and just let each other know that we're not alone. Father, prepare us for the traps that are to come. Lord, prepare us for the things the devil is going to try to use to trip us up. Lord, may we keep our eyes on you constantly. But we do ask that you would bless this time of ministry away from this building. That, Lord, the church would be the church. That, God, you would be glorified because of it. God, we ask that you continue to uh, use us in mighty ways. Lord, show us the opportunities that you've laid in front of us. Lord, we love you and we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen.